Hey everyone, and welcome to another mini-sode of the Investigation Game. During our time at home, Leah has been creating free webinars every week that are filled with amazing information. So we thought for these next few weeks, instead of our usual mini-sodes, we would give you all the shortened version of the webinars. If you find them informative, feel free to join in on the full-length live event, or if you missed one of the older webinars, we post them all on YouTube. I'll be sure to attach the links to our events page as well as our YouTube page in the show notes. Stay safe, stay healthy, and we'll see you soon. The objectives for today, and this does look like a lot, it actually looks like more than the payroll session, but I think some of these examples are pretty quick. The way that we view data analytics, and we have a huge poster in our training room that actually says this, is that we're going to take what happened, what actually happened, what is the data that supports what happened. So maybe it's a list of transactions showing that an employee got a bank account at the same bank as the company and transferred funds out of the bank account and sent that to their personal bank account. That is what happened. Then we're going to compare it to what should have happened. Okay. So maybe we have to look at Okay, what are all the transfers that the company made? And then we identify the known bank accounts. So then we can see which bank accounts are unknown. Okay, so that's our comparison. So we're going to compare what happened versus what should have happened. Then when we look at kind of the connection between these, so the things that match, if I take this list of transfers that this employee made, that he made for lots of people, lots of purposes, whatever. And I compare that to the list of what were approved transfers. The unapproved transfer should then fall out. And it's that part that's not matching that typically contains your loss. So today we're going to focus on the way I like to explain fraud schemes. I had an employee uh, and she worked for me for a long time, but I remember whenever she, she first worked for me, she said, I feel like there are so many ways that people could commit fraud. How do you know where to start looking? As we were talking through it, she said, oh, so basically people just write checks to themselves. I was like, oh yeah. I mean, in a really generalized fashion, yeah, you're right. But then just as we started kind of talking about it more, I realized there's really only a finite number of ways or access points that somebody has to steal money out of an organization. And it's going to be when cash comes into an organization And and by cash, I mean anything that increases somebody's buying power. Okay, but we're just going to call it cash. But it could be cash, checks, payroll, all of those things. But we're going to group them together. So how does cash come into your business and how does cash leave your business? Okay, so the focus of today's presentation is on how like when cash comes into your business, into your organization, it could even be into an estate. I mean, this could be in any invest in any fraud investigation. So when that money comes in, there's only so many access points that somebody could steal money. And so if we can identify what those access points are, then we can actually set up things to detect, to you know trigger a red flag, or to prevent these things ongoing. I personally think we can't prevent all fraud. I think that fraud will happen. It's what have we set up to detect it so that we don't have these huge losses. Our cash in typically is cash, check, credit card. That revenue is reflective of the sales and what we're in business to actually do. Then there's also areas of miscellaneous income. So maybe scrap income. Our example today is about rental income, maybe like subletting because we're not in business to do that, but that's another source of income. So let's get into some examples. And I've broken these down by scheme and also by payment type. Our first example is a clothing store. We're just going to call it clothing store LLC. They were a retail store. There was a couple of people who were related who were running this store. One was the general manager and one was like kind of a clerk. The owner knows that there's a problem. We started with how did this company receive revenue? And they received it through cash. They accepted cash. They accepted credit cards. They accepted checks. They accepted cash through the point of sale or the cash register. They accepted checks the same way, received credit cards the same way. But in addition, they also would go to like trade shows. And so they also had a square account. So that gave us some areas that, okay, we're going to go look at these areas. The one thing we want to look at is we want to take the point of sale records, how much was recorded as cash payments, and then how much of that cash actually made it to the bank. 
Now I know, I know it's not going to reconcile perfectly. They're going to leave some in the drawer. They might've used some for expenses, whatever, but still we need to see some sort of correlation that this cash is getting deposited. Plus the general manager was telling the owner that this was happening. What we're going to start with today, this is actually from this case. I've just cleaned it up. We've got our point of sale payment export. And we're going to look at that a little closer. And then also we at Workman Forensics, we digitize our bank statements. So the first thing that we do, we add a few fields to our um, exports. So let me just kind of go over this. Columns B through H, those came from the point of sale system. We were able to export this information. I think we had to clean it up a little. If you dealt with data at all, that's not surprising. We like to add line numbers to our information so that we can sort, but then we also remember how we receive the information. And then we like to add something called a year column, a year month column, and then we'll talk about this last column here in a second. We're gonna add these columns that I've highlighted in green. These formulas allow us to pull out the year from the date column, and then also just pull out the year and month in the date column because that makes it where we can summarize on a year month basis and we can compare things on a monthly basis by year it just makes it really helpful and then of course that gives us a column that we can uh, summarize by year as well so what we're wanting to do we're wanting to look at how how much cash made it to the bank account okay and so we're going to take these point of sale records and then we're going to um, summarize this information by our year month column to see how much cash was received according to the point of sale during this time period. So what this formula does is it returns to you the summarized amount for let's say July 2012 just on one line and then you can filter that then summarize. So then as you can see here we've now summarized by year month how many cash payments we received in the point of sale. Then we're going to do essentially the same thing over on the bank statement. And what we're wanting to do is identify all of the cash deposits, which yes, we had to go through and itemize those deposits so that we knew whether it was cash or checks, your month column. And then we're going to do the exact same formula, only this time we're looking for the words cash deposit. Then our next step is we're going to take that summarized information and we're going to just compare them on a monthly basis. And as you can see, $95,000 did not make it to the bank in cash. One of the things that if you've worked with law enforcement at all or any type of cash fraud cases, the one thing that law enforcement does not love it are cash cases because anyone could have spent that cash. Well, in this particular case, we they had a civil lawsuit already. And so we were able to subpoena the or the attorneys were able to subpoena the bank accounts for our subjects and so we went and we scheduled all of the subjects bank accounts we combine all of those and then we could look just to see was cash deposited to this bank account checks we also did something called a lifestyle analysis which we'll probably do in another training but we did a lifestyle analysis based on data for this one as well and what we discovered was that if this subject hadn't deposited cash she wouldn't have even been able to like pay her bills. So there was extra cash coming from somewhere. And we had all her bank accounts, her payroll accounts, her husband's accounts, they were all combined. And over this period of time, she actually had deposited quite the sum of cash. We did find during this time period, and it was $23,508. So we had that much extra cash. It's not gonna tie out to our 95,000 because you can just spend cash. You don't have to deposit it you know, for it to be used and beneficial to you. So, uh, but this helped law enforcement understand our case. Uh, for fraud, you have to have intent and you have to have benefit. And so fraud investigators are primarily looking at who benefited and how much did they, they benefit. So that's where tracing that, taking that to the next step to look at the subject's bank accounts and see what those deposits consisted of and finding that cash, that's where that's really important. So the other thing in this case is that there were deleted and voided point of sale transactions and deleted or voided cash transactions. We actually went to look to see you know, if we could quantify any of that to determine how much cash wasn't recorded to the point of sale. So we knew that there was a difference of $95,000 when I compare what was recorded versus what made it to the bank. We couldn't quantify 
how much cash had just been skimmed. And the difference between skimming and larceny is that skimming is when it's not recorded when it's stolen. Larceny is when it's been recorded and then it's stolen afterwards. So the next thing we tried to look at were their inventory records because we could have perhaps backed into uh, the amount of cash that had been skimmed. But their inventory, since the two people control it, there were two people and they're working together. One of them stole the cash, one of them stole the checks. As you can imagine, their inventory records were unreliable. And because we only include in our losses what we can prove that and what data supports, then we didn't get to include anything for the cash skimming. So even though this business was missing $95,000 of cash, they were probably missing more. Okay, so the next type, like I said, one individual stole all the cash or a lot of the cash. One of them stole the checks. We ran the exact same analysis, but just looking at checks. So once again, we look at our year, year month transaction, I, I mean column, and then we just do the exact same thing where we summarize the check payment totals by month. And then we're going to do that on our bank statement as well. And then we're going to compare the two. So we're going to look for our check deposits. So then since we had this other subject's bank account, just like we had the cash subject's bank account, we could go see all the checks that were deposited to the subject's personal bank accounts. And what we found were all of these checks that were made out, they were made payable to Clothing Store LLC and they were deposited to the subject's personal bank account. She had not created a DBA or anything like that where you know she was depositing it to Clothing Store. It, she was depositing it to her own personal bank account. I think our loss was about 35,000 um, whenever we compared point of sale to our check deposits, but the total checks deposited to her bank account were over $50,000. So we knew that they're both check larceny and also check skimming. Credit card skimming. I mentioned at the beginning that this company had credit card payments that were taken in the business. They had a retail store, storefront. So they were taken at the point of sale, but also they had Square. Through the civil lawsuit, they were able to subpoena the, the Square records. And what was so helpful about this is that Square would show us where the payments had been deposited. So we knew that this wasn't deposited to the company's bank account, but there was a little complication. The subject's husband had an electrical business, let's just say. And so he would go to people's houses and they use Square to take payments. And so we couldn't just say that all of the deposits in her bank account or that had been used through the Square account were bad. And so we actually had to look at where did these transactions take place? Square actually provides GPS coordinates for each transaction. So then we could see where was the subject actually receiving these payments. Some of them were exactly where the tra trade show was. Some of them even took place. She was uh, skimming these payments right at the store. So instead of using the point of sale, she's standing in the location of the store taking these payments through Square and then some were at homes. So then that way we were able to say, okay, the ones that happened at homes, we're gonna, we're gonna treat those as those were legitimate. So this way we kind of uncommingled those uh, deposits between what was expected and not expected. So we could look at Square deposits. We also, once again, created what, you know, my workman forensics fields that we've already talked about. And then Square also provided GPS. And so in this case, we used a combination, all of the files came to us in Excel, but we actually used IDEA to use the feature join to then join these records together because the deposit information came on one export and the GPS and individual sales came on another. So we used IDEA to um, match and join those transactions together. Then we also have just receivable skimming. This could also, I guess, be considered check skimming or any of things we've already talked about, but I wanted to kind of highlight something that we love about QuickBooks. And I, I've met several fraud investigators who love the audit trail in QuickBooks. But the one thing that we don't often love is how this exports to Excel. So if you're not familiar with the QuickBooks export of the audit trail, the audit trail will show you if things have been modified. It even shows you when things are added by user, you know, date, timestamp, um, and then it also shows when things are deleted. This is what this report looks like. Then when you export it, it is just as helpful. And we're talking every transaction. So 
Running an audit trail actually takes a while if you just even run it for a year. We have actually built a macro that takes this information and turns it into a table that you can actually use. What this guy was doing was he would issue the invoice and then whenever the payment came in, he would take the payment and then he would go into QuickBooks, delete the invoice, and then he took the payment. He is somebody that let's say the business name was Workman Forensics LLC. He went to his bank and set up a DBA under Workman Forensics and then deposited all of these checks there. And for him, he stole about $160,000. Now, the last category that I want to touch on is when revenue is used to cover fraud. And so in this case, we had something just miscellaneous income. That's how it shows up on the PL. And it didn't match what was expected for subletting revenue. So if I charge $1,000 a month to somebody to rent this little office out and I didn't see what I expected. We're talking much larger numbers than that, but that's kind of the gist. So what we did whenever they said, hey, this just doesn't look right. We were, we were investigating lots of other things on the expense side, but then they discovered this as well. We asked to see the general ledger account detail just so we could see what was happening. Were deposits just not being made? Like maybe the deposit was being skimmed in one of the ways we've talked about, or was something happening like on the books? We asked for the general ledger. What I loved about the transactions was Whoever was recording these, they actually left us some notes. And then we see all these debits. Whenever you're recording some sort of income, you're going to credit this account. So the fact that we had debits in an income account was very strange. There might be some reasons, like maybe they, I don't know, maybe they just lumped their miscellaneous income and expenses together. That might have made sense. But the fact that we had so many debits was very strange. So then we want to see the other side of that transaction because for every debit, there's also a credit, vice versa. So then we go to look at the credit side and we find that there are business expenses, business promotion, advertising, entertainment and meals that were essentially being reclassified against this miscellaneous income. We then went to the bank statements and what we discovered whenever we compared these transactions to the bank statement was that this individual was making a lot of donations to his kid's school. He was, uh, he gave $10,000 to a personal friend. He hosted a golf tournament that was not company related for his friends. Uh, there was a plastic surgery payment. I mean, it was all kinds of stuff and they were hiding it in the miscellaneous income so that business promotions, advertising, entertainment and meals wouldn't be overstated and a red flag to the uh, business owners. The Investigation Game is brought to you by Workman Forensics. For more information on the business and its services, visit workmanforensics.com. Find us on social media on any social media platform at Workman Forensics. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, or topic ideas, please email us at podcast at workmanforensics.com. Thanks for listening.